<laughs> My message this morning is our identity in Jesus. If you were here October 21, you would have heard a message almost exactly the same. So that will affect a couple of you, not many. We have had a lot of changes in the last three years. <laughs> Did want to say something about that was graveside service last night. Uh, we were, it was sprinkling a little bit and thundering the whole time, lightning, thunder. But it kind of fit the mood we were in. But as we laid Della into the ground, a dove flew across the sky and the sun was shining off of it. It was just white. Beautiful sight. And then right after that, the rainbow. Not that we have to have signs to know God loves us and cares for us, but it was special. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. I hope you get that. Don't belittle yourself. Don't think less of, your, of yourself. Just don't think about yourself so much. If that makes any sense. You know what, I forgot my book. So how do you define your identity? Who are you? I hear people talking about the lady on the scooter in town. That could be Carolyn's identity. Yeah. A lot of us, our jobs are our identity. Some of us try to be different so we stand out and create an identity that way. Some young people choose rebellion as an identity. They identify in how bad they can be. So what is the identity you're trying to portray? Do others see Jesus when they see you? <coughs> Satan wants you to define yourself by the hurts and pain you have endured in your life. By the opinions of others by your past sin. Some people try to define you by your past sins, by your past. This is not from God. And this can lead to you being resentful and bitter about yourself, even towards God. Satan says you need to earn God's love, that you're not good enough. You will never amount to anything. If you remember nothing else, remember this. Satan is a liar, and there is no truth in him. John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan's identity is he is a deceiver, deceiver, a liar. That's his identity. Remember that. However, we are made in the image of God. Some have said man makes God in his image. 
We made God out to be what we wanted to be. We don't get to decide who God is. God is God no matter whether we believe in him or not. We try to make God fit what we want him to be. Most of us don't choose our identity. Instead, we simply internalize the values of our parents or the culture around us, which is the pursuit of materialism, power, and appearance. Or like we talked about in Sunday school, the pursuit of a good reputation. Having a good reputation is a good thing, but don't put your identity in that. Psalms 139. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit or stand. I have the batteries going out. When far away. Around us. 
whatever it is, the ocean waves crashing in, the big mountains, especially out in the Rocky Mountains. We appreciate that, but we don't worship that. We worship the one who created that, the creator God, not his creation. That's a very important distinction. And I think too often we worship the gifts and abilities God has given us rather than the God who created us. And unfortunately, sometimes we use the gifts to have, to have power over other people. I'm a prophet, so you need to listen to me. That is abused a lot. So what happens when you're to your identity when you experience failure? You lose a person's favor, or become burned out in your job or place of service. The very foundation of our identity is shaken and altered, altered, resulting in us hustling to define ourselves by something or someone else. A stable sense of self cannot fully exist when we place our identity in external things because our identity will change with the constant flux fluxation of the circumstances in our lives. In March of 2020, my identity as a realtor was ripped away from me. We were shut down. We weren't sure what was going to happen. And I struggled with that a few days until I realized God loves me, God cares for me. That's what I need to focus on, not on my job. And I think my identity was wrapped up in that a little too much. And then when it was taken away, I struggled. Genesis 1.26, then God said, Let us make man in our own image, in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over all the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. We are made, you are made in God's image. You are an image bearer of God. The image of God refers to the immaterial part of humanity. God is not flesh and blood. So you're saying we're made in the image of God, but we all look different. Yes, that's correct. That's not the image we're talking about. God is not flesh and blood. It sets human beings apart from the animal world, fits them for the dominion God intended for them to have over the earth, and enables them to commune with God, our Maker. It is a likeness mentally, morally, and socially. Part of being made in God's image is that Adam had the capacity to make free choices. Although they were given a righteous nature, Adam and Eve made an evil choice to rebel against their Creator. In so doing, they marred the image of God within themselves and passed that damaged likeness to all their descendants, including you and I. Romans 5.12 talks about that. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Today we still bear the image of God, but we also bear the scars of sin. 
Mentally, morally, socially, and physically, we show the effects of sin. But again, that's not your identity. That's not your real identity. Your real identity is in Jesus. The good news is that when God redeems an individual, he begins to restore the original image of God, creating a new self, created to be a true, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And Ephesians 4.24, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That redemption is only available by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. That redemption is only available by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior from the sin that separates us from God. Through Christ, we are made new creations in the likeness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Have you allowed Jesus to change you? Is your old dead? That's part of the battle we have. Our flesh is battling against the spiritual. It's a constant battle. We'll symbolize that this evening with Kaylee's baptism. Submerge her in the water, washing away the old self, and then bringing her out into the new life in Jesus. We may receive an overwhelming amount of messages telling us to define ourselves by external measures. But what would it look like if we base our identity on the way that God sees us? Benner again, Benner states that an identity grounded in God would mean that when we think of who we are, the first thing that would come to mind is our status as someone who is deeply loved by God. God loves you unconditionally. You can turn to Ephesians 1. I'm actually going to be reading this from the Living Bible. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 8. How we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every blessing in heaven because we belong to Christ. Long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. He decided then to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. We who stand before him covered with his love. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And he did this because he wanted to. Verse 6. Now all praise to God for his wonderful kindness to us and his favor that he has poured out upon us because we belong to his dearly loved Son. So overflowing is his kindness towards us that he took away all our sins through the blood of his Son, by whom we are saved. And he has showered down upon us the richness of his grace, for how well he understands us and knows what is best for us at all times. Some versions say he lavished on us. And if you have a good memory, you'll remember this. Have a piece of bread, homemade bread preferably, fresh, new. And then I put apple butter on it. I love apple butter. 
I'm going to lavish that apple butter on my bread, and I'm going to make sure every single corner of that bread is covered in my apple butter. That's what makes it good. That's how God loves us. Every corner of our lives. It is in the power of the Holy Spirit and in consequence of our position in Christ that God has lavished on us all wisdom and insight. We are not only saved by Christ, but He is our salvation. We are not only redeemed by Christ, but He is our redemption. We not only are given wisdom and insight, but Christ is our wisdom and insight. In the power of the Spirit, knowing that Christ has been lavished in such abundance, let us ensure that we live our lives in a manner that is worthy of the great gift that we have received. Let me read that again. Knowing that Christ has been lavished in such abundance, let us ensure that we live our lives in a manner that is worthy of the great gift that we have received. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Rick Warren said in a sermon called Learning My True Identity in Christ, he talked about five fingerprints of your identity. And they're from 1 Peter chapter 2, just two verses, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and did his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Peter was talking to the Gentiles here, who once weren't the chosen people, but now are, and that is us. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are his own special people. And most of all, we have obtained mercy. We are special to God. He chose us. Remember Ephesians 1, 5. He adopted us into his family. He chose to adopt us into his family. We are now a part of that royal priesthood, a holy people. Really? Are we holy? Don't feel like that a lot of days, does it? When we repent and ask God for forgiveness, the blood of Jesus cleanses us and makes us holy. It is not our own doing, but through the blood of Jesus. When we repent of our sins, our sins are gone, and God sees the blood of Jesus on our lives. He no longer sees our sins. We are a special people. We have obtained mercy. John 3, 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. God has an agape love for us. One writer said agape love doesn't describe an emotion at all. And I tend to agree with him. Agape love isn't based on affection or approval. It is totally unconditional, coming as a free gift, not because we deserve it, but because God chooses to give it. None of us deserve God's love, but He loves us anyways. We need to have a copy love for each other. Talk 
about that in Sunday school. I think Larry asked the question. Do you do things for others and not expect anything in return? Or when you know there can't be anything in return, do you still show love? Too often our love is conditional. We love because they did something nice to us. Too often our love is emotional, and that's not wrong, but that in itself is not enough. We need to love because God loves us. It's the decision of the will to act in the other person's best interest, whether you feel like it or not. Some of you newly married might not have experienced that yet, but you probably have. Some days you don't feel like loving your spouse as much. But you need to love her anyhow, or him. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What a testimony. Remember, the old has passed away, and the new is now, which is Jesus. So it's no longer my flesh that lives, but Christ that lives in me. I think that's a decision we need to make each and every day. We must surrender to Jesus. Allow Him to create a new heart in us and give up our past. Allow the living water to wash away our past hurts, our pain. We can no longer use the victim card to excuse our behavior. I think too often we claim to be a victim so it's not our fault. We're a victim, so it's okay to act the way I am and acting, because it wasn't my fault. That's not living for Jesus. We use that as an excuse so we don't have to take responsibility for the way we are. We need to surrender that to Jesus. Allow Jesus to transform your life. Jesus wants to help us. We need to allow him to. Jesus doesn't force himself on us. It may seem painful and even scary to fully trust Jesus. Remember, you are made in God's image. He loves you. Yes, things in life have happened that made me the way I am. But remember, I am a new creation in Christ. The old things are gone. All things are new. Stop hanging on to the old. Psalms 139. Close with these verses. 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in thy way everlasting. May this be our desire, our prayer, each and every day. We need to have an attitude of that. Lord, is there anything in me that needs to prevention, that needs to change? Again, daily you need to surrender your will to the will of God. So remember, you are a child of God. Don't allow Satan to define your identity. Each one of you here this morning was created in the image of God. You are loved by God unconditionally. 
Allow Jesus to be your Lord and Savior so that you will have your identity in Jesus. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. Will you open it? Will you let him in? Again, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. Will you let him in? And identify with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. That's where your identity needs to be, church. In Jesus. And it should be visible to those around you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the suffering you did and dying on the cross for our sins. And you rose again to reign over the world, Lord. And that we can be identified with you, Lord Jesus. You come into our lives when we accept you, Lord, as your Lord, as our Lord and Savior. Thank you so much that we can now be identified with you, Jesus. Lord, my prayer is that others around us could see you when they talk and are around us, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would help us to surrender our will to yours. Help us, Lord. Help us to obey your word and do your will each and every day, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you so much for your great love and mercy for us each and every day, Lord. Lord, I pray now for each one here. I pray your blessing be upon each of us. Guide us, direct us, Lord. And Lord, help us to be shining lights for you in the community here in Africa. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Have a great week. You are excused.